but he needs um, translation right this second. So I, you know, as you probably know, my, my presentation was switched from earlier today, and uh, you know, I said, you know, it's okay, everything that happens happens for the best. And I actually, I, I didn't quite know how I would start this because it felt like such a shift in tone and a shift in the theme, but we make a lot of really do for it when she brought the conversation back to some of the things that are happening in the country. Um, you know, this is a communication forum, and what I want to talk about is how we uh, bring into this discussion those who are the least visible in the society. So in this case, I want us to talk about how, uh, about the people who experience war, and who experience war trauma, psychological war trauma. I should say right away, I'm not a psychologist, I'm not a psychiatrist, but it's a topic that living in the US, I follow very, quite, quite intensively, because of course the US is constantly fighting wars, and so the issue of veteran care, and the issue of the struggles that the veterans have is very, uh, is very much, it's not so high in the news all the time, but it's constantly present. So I was following it. And so when um, the war began in Ukraine, I needed to begin to think about, is Ukraine prepared to deal with this issue? Because this issue will come up, the psychological traumas of war, the psychological stress of the war, and what it does. Uh, and of course, clearly, because if things happen so fast, um, Ukraine was not prepared for it, and it's natural. Um, and so I, I did some research. I wrote an article about it. I have a few copies of that article if you want to, to take one, come up to me afterwards. So, so far, uh, Ukraine has had 250,000 soldiers serving in, in, in the east of the country. 110,000 of them have been demobilized. So these are people who are coming back and they are reintegrated to the society. And that is a very hard task for a number of reasons, right? Because military conflict has very deep personal and societal consequences. Um, and you know, just out of curiosity, how many people here have had family or friends, loved ones, serving the conflict in the East? Okay, just just a few. Um, so this, uh, I'm gonna come back to it. Um, you know, and I, I know that the issue of uh, combat stress now does receive a lot of um, attention in Ukraine, uh, but some deeper moments in the discussion are missing. So what are some of the things that this combat stress can lead to. And another term for it that sometimes is used is PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. Uh, it's, they're not always equal, but both can lead to depression, anxiety, violent outbursts, emotional withdrawals, isolation, conflicts in the family, conflicts in the, uh, in the workplace. May, right? Not always, because I understand that today there is actually an image of a veteran that's forming in Ukraine that suggests that all of the veterans are that way. It's not true, it depends on how people manage to process the trauma. Uh, but in some cases, this can be the case. And also, there are deeper issues, such as shame, guilt, and negative self-worth. So, shame about what? Shame about the fact that it's survivor's guilt, right? It's the fact that you were there, and you left, and some of your bodies may not have, right? So some people did not survive the survivor's guilt. And shame because, as a soldier, you break certain uh, rules that are very strong in our society, right? You have to kill, right? And for us, one of the greatest um, sort of foundational uh, statements is that thou shalt not kill, but people do. And so it's very hard. There is the issue of, you know, in the US, they now talk about moral injury, that the soldier feels that he or she stepped over certain boundaries, and now they don't know how to live with themselves when they come back. So that's, that's a big issue. Um, so how do other countries deal with it? I thought that it would be really interesting to look at the statistics. In Ukraine, unfortunately, the statistics are really hard to come by, and it's one of the problems here that needs to be, it's one of the issues that needs to be In the US, 15 to 25% of veterans suffer from post-traumatic stress disorder. In Canada, it's about 10%. In Israel, 1 to 2%. So that's quite a huge difference, right? So 1 to 2% in Israel, 15 to 25% in the US. So the question, the good news in this is clearly there's something that we can do that can make that difference. Some things we can do, some things we cannot. But there are some things that can be changed, some things that depend on us. So what are some of those things? Uh, I'll get to that, but let's talk about something. Let's talk about some of the problematic issues, uh, for example, in the US also. Um, in the US, the homelessness level among veteran population 
population is huge. But any given night, so 15,000 veterans are homeless. 15,000 every night, right? There's a population of about 20 million veterans in the US. That is the size of our wars. Uh, but 15,000 of them are homeless. And a lot of times it's attributed to post-traumatic stress because people were not able to reintegrate. How is it in Ukraine? We don't know. Again, we don't have statistics. In Israel, it's not an issue. Another problem that we have is suicides, uh, military veteran suicides. Uh, in the US, 22 veterans commit suicide every day. So it's basically every hour. Now, some people say that this should be, should be taken into context. That's approximately how many suicides occur in, in general in the, in the US population. Still, it's a huge number. In Israel, you have, it's very, very small. You have 28 cases of suicides in 2010 among veterans, seven cases in 2013, five cases in 2014. And that's considering that the whole society served, right? So basically, the entire society, 60% of uh, people in, the, in Israel served. So among them, such a small number of suicides, that's pretty significant, right? So again, we can ask ourselves the question, why is that? What is the difference? So one of the things that we know is that the society to which a veteran returns, to which a soldier returns from war, plays a big Some societies are simply better at reintegrating their veterans than others. So what plays a role? If you take the US, only a small percentage of people serves, right? It's not a volunteer army, it's not a conscription army, right? It's, it's volunteer army. People, only those who want to serve, serve, right? So there's no general conscription. It's a very small percentage. War uh, percentage. Wars are fought far away, right? In far away countries. People are deployed for long periods of time. So when they come back, first of all, when they are away at war, the country does not change. Nothing happens in the country. It's one veteran wrote uh, or said, I read, I read in, in an interview. He said, I went to war and the country went to the mall. Right? So the country went shopping while he went to war. So he's there defending the country. He comes back. The society, the country lives as if nothing had happened. Meanwhile, he has death, he's lost his friends and buddies, right? It's been a life-changing experience. That makes integration very, very, very hard. So even though the US has great medical services, great veteran care, everything is there, but the society is very hard to reintegrate back into. People feel misunderstood, they feel that they their loved ones can't ask them the right questions, they, they can't share their experiences, it's very hard. On the opposite scale is Israel, where, again, 60% of the population serves. The only two categories of people who don't serve are the Arab population and the uh, Orthodox, highly religious people don't serve. The rest do. So what happens? People come back and their boss has served, their work colleague has served, their family member has served, their neighbor has served. They know exactly what this person is responding to. So they think that it's already easier to integrate because of that. And moreover, the country is small, right? All of the conflicts are fought basically right at its borders. When there is no um, active warfare, people come back from service, right? They come back home every couple of weeks, you know, they, they have they spend a weekend at home, they have Shabbat dinners at home. They are never too far separated from normal life. So when they come back, it's easy to reintegrate. So knowing this, we can ask ourselves, how is it in Ukraine? Right? Ukraine doesn't fall into either one of these categories. Uh, it's a bigger country, you know, a, a larger percentage of people serves, but not quite the full, not, not quite the full society. Right? So you can start thinking about this these categories of people. How hard or how easy is it for the returning veterans to reintegrate? And what can we do to make it easier? So, you know, of course there are policy restrictions, and there are services, you know, there is there are certain things that the ministries can, uh, can do. There is social services, there is veteran services, medical services. That's all important. Psychological care, clearly, they're very important. But I'm more interested here about challenging our own stereotypes, right? Because all of us here, all of you here, are citizens of Ukraine. So you can be citizens, but you also deal with, you can also think about it. You're a professional, so you can think about it. What can I, as a PR professional, do? to challenge certain things that are very, very different. So for example, uh, the image of the veteran. Uh, you know, my understanding is that here in Ukraine, when you say veteran, what do you think about? You probably think mostly about a veteran of World War II. You don't think about the fact that this could be a young kid who's in his 20s, just came back from the East. He's a veteran, right? He's a 40s. So it's a very different image, and it changes 
how we communicate to that person. Um, there is a, right now, there is sort of a, this understanding that soldiers, when they come back from war, they need to go to a cemetery. You know, spend a lot of resources have gone to that. You know, let them spend five days or maybe a couple of weeks at a cemetery, relax, get better. It may be nice, but you know what happens? They find themselves at the class cemetery among old ladies, among sick people, and they are young, and they think of themselves as warriors, and they think of themselves as protectors. They are not feeling really great, because this is one of the things that we also need to understand. Military culture in general has never been particularly hospitable to notions of psychological problems. I, you know, people who think of psychological problems are not crazy, right? So they carry all this just inside. Uh, the willingness to go to a psychologist or psychiatrist for someone who thinks of himself or herself, right, but is still working for himself, as mostly men, he thinks of himself as a protector, as a warrior, as a defender. What, I'm gonna go just because I'm feeling blue? No, right? So we need to change that. And in the U.S., they can do some very interesting things, actually, to change that, pers uh, that perception. When you have time, look up a website called realwarriors.com. So the Department of Defense has given, I think it's $2.7 million, it's a lot of money, but in the context of the Department of Defense's budget, is small change, right? So they gave a small amount of money to build this website where they are framing the language around, uh, around psychological problems, around PTSD, and around warriors, around soldiers going to ask for help. So first of all, the website is called realwarriors.com. You go on that website and it's all about still videos of soldiers, including high level officers, commanders, who are talking about how they dealt with combat stress and how hard it was for them and how much anxiety and depression they felt, how they couldn't come back and you know, have a harmonious relationship with their wives. So when somebody comes to that website and he's having doubts about whether or not he should go and ask for help, he looks at it and says, well, you know what? I'm not crazy. It's actually normal. A lot of my peers do that, a lot of my families do that. So another thing here is that they reframe uh, the notion of psychological problems to, and they call it as psychological wounds. Right? What does that do? The word wounds in military culture is honor. Right? You have physical wounds. That's honorable. You lose your lip. That's honorable. Right? Everybody wants to be hero. If you say, well, I can't have anxiety or depression, I'm so sad, well, then the message well, they now call it psychological wounding. It's just a change of words, but it's a change of perception as well, and I found it very, very powerful. Uh, also, instead of you know, talking about, oh, go to psychologists, go to psychiatrists, they actually use the term resilience training. You use resilience training. So what is resilience, right? It's your ability to withstand difficulties. And so when people see that in those terms, they're also much more willing to go and ask for help. And that's extremely important. So something like that could be done in Ukraine as well. And I actually know of some, at least one group that's working in that direction, using the example of that Real Warriors uh, website. But I'm wondering if some of you who work in the PR thing, maybe you could, I don't think it's really necessary, is a public education campaign that would we sort of sweep the whole country, that we reach out to all levels of the population because everybody needs to be educated about these issues. We need to normalize, uh, in Ukraine, we need to normalize the issue of, of uh, soldiers, or veterans rather, uh, going for help. And not necessarily immediately granted as being crazy, it would be uh, dangerous for society. That's something I've also seen that you know, veterans are dangerous, we can hire them, they can work. Let's normalize about that. Let's say that these are people who need our support, right? We as a society, they serve a society, we need to support them. There's also a need to normalize psychology as a profession. And this is something that's, uh, it's the, um, you know, Ukraine inherits it from the Soviet past. Uh, it's the same, I would say, around the entire Soviet territory. This, this psychological profession is associated with war. It's associated with pills that will turn into a vegetable and straight jackets that will prevent you from going wild, right? That's an MCMP, but that's what we used to have in the Soviet Union. So it still exists. So in, you know, there is no license, and the professions are just that. There is no license, there is no um, ethical sort of code of, uh, code of ethics. Anybody can really sort of hang a black house at their house and say, I'm a psychologist, let me go help a few veterans. So that also needs to change. That's, that's a policy issue, so it may not be necessarily for communication support. But it's something to be aware of. It's something to, something to understand. Um, so, uh, so 
So this issue, I think I have to make some some kind of some things. Uh, this issue uh, is important because it's here to stay. You know, people take time to recover. They take years. Some people take go through quickly. Some people take longer. Um, I saw some statistic that there are, there are two million veterans in Ukraine overall. Again, looking at statistics, we different to the wars. But of course, it's the most. And by the way, very often. In, in, in the U.S., people with the highest level of PTSD are uh, Vietnam veterans, 35% of them, because that was the first time when the people really started paying attention to it. And uh, here in this area, the veterans of the Afghan war in Soviet times also have very high levels of PTSD, but we now have a chance to change things for the current generation. Um, let's see, so just to kind of uh, summarize things, right? So what are some of the positive things that Ukraine has that, it, that would make it easier for it to integrate its veterans, soldiers, back into the society as they become veterans. There's a great level of solidarity with troops. The volunteer effort throughout the last two years was really extraordinary. And so even those people who did not serve can relate to a lot of the issues that the soldiers went through. So that's really important. Uh, the war is viewed as just by most people. That's also really important because in the US, you know, the wars that America fights are very different. They're so far away, it's not always possible to say, was it a just war, was it not a just war? Vietnam is high end of war. That makes it hard for veterans to come back and reintegrate because they sacrifice. And then they come back and they hear things like, oh, well, this was the day, right? And we were doing civilians. So in Ukraine, I don't think that that's an issue. But there are other issues. Again, there are issues on the policy level, bureaucratic hurdles to security benefits. Uh, difficulties getting hired for veterans, there are, and there are all the misperceptions that I talked about. Uh, and I'll mention one more thing, um, you know, and that's more sort of the one-on-one -on -one interactions. So in the U.S., you know, we often will see a soldier or a veteran who will say, thank you for your service. I've read some very interesting statements from veterans who say, don't tell me this. Say, keep it, just better not say anything. Because what they perceive it as is they perceive it as sort of this easy, you know, it's like it's it's, a, it's our way of releasing out of the guilt the fact that we did not sacrifice and they did. And so we say thank you for your service. But what's behind it? There's nothing really. We are not there to hear them, we're not there to understand what experiences they went through. Which is throw it's a throwaway phrase, as we say in English, right? So it may be, I don't know how it is in Ukraine. I know that there is a way also to address the address of soldiers here. Maybe it's it's good and maybe I don't know, maybe it's something for us all, for all of you to think about. What do I mean when I say, for example, Slava Ukraini or Slava? Do I really mean something? You know, or am I just simply saying it as a you know as a password or just to let myself off the hook? So the question is, are we prepared to hear what the veterans have gone through? Truly, lend them the ear and try to understand. Because this is the issue of relating. You know, part of what would make it easy for them to get reintegrated is how well we can relate to them and how well they can relate to us. Um, I think that, yes, I'll, I'll wrap it up here uh, because my time is running out. But I would say that as PR professionals, to think about these issues. Maybe you can you know, do some more volunteering and help some nonprofits who work with veterans. In fact, I'm just going to read a, a statement, a little, just a, a phrase, from the US National Coalition of Homeless Veterans. They know that the most active, pro uh, the most effective programs for homeless and at risk veterans are community based, nonprofit, veterans helping veterans groups, programs that seek to best feature transitional housing with the camaraderie of living structured substance free environments with fellow veterans who are succeeding at veterans themselves. There are organizations in Ukraine who are doing that, who are providing these kinds of living environments where veterans can be together with peers where they feel understood. But what's really needed is to integrate all of the back into the society and help the society understand what's going on and uh, and change the perceptions. So, thank you very much.